Wasn't yesterday just a gorgeous day? I mean, so incredibly pretty. Hope you had a chance to get outside. But there's one thing that I've noticed that when the summer heat tries to hold on the best it can, and then a little bit of cool comes in, there's an interesting weather phenomenon that becomes pretty common. What is that? We call it fog. Now, I don't know about you guys. I wear progressive lenses but there's nothing in my lenses that helps me see in the fog. When I have an occasion to leave my house and come this way and it's still dark outside, I've determined that is the worst driving conditions for me. It's dark and it's foggy. I have the hardest time seeing. And you know, I find myself, I just have my chin up underneath my steering wheel because what what happens in the fog? It's easy to lose perspective, isn't it? You know, you can imagine that you're seeing things uh, as I'm thinking, Is that a trash can up ahead or is somebody on the side of the road? I don't know. But then also in the fog, it tends to magnify the way we're feeling, doesn't it? Just kind of misty and dark, sort of makes it feel ominous. And if you walk out, if you leave your house, maybe you got a little anxiety going on or whatever, it just seems to make it worse, doesn't it? I think living in a fog is probably a pretty good way to describe this last eight months. It has seemed that way, hasn't it? With the virus, there's uncertainty about it. Is, are we gonna get, get over with it? Are we gonna continue to get sick? How careful do we have to be? There's just an uncertainty. There's a confusion about it. And certainly as we look at our land, we look at our country, we see the conflict, we see everything that's going on and we just think, man, what, what is gonna happen with this? It's just real easy to lose perspective, isn't it? Things that bother us seem to be bothering us so much more. Feels like we're caught in a fog. And friends, I want to tell you today that we have an enemy. Seriously, we have a real enemy who loves the fog. He loves the confusion of the fog. He loves the division that we're experiencing right now. He loves the chaos. He loves the fog. But I want to tell you today that God's word speaks to this enemy. And we're going to go on a journey today. We're going to go on a journey in God's word. If you're a note taker, I encourage you to take notes. If you're not, take notes today because we're going to see what scripture has to tell us. Because this is so vital. We've been talking about a lot of battles. We've been talking about the battle for truth, the battle for life, the battle for marriage, the battle for liberty. But today we're going to see that there's actually a battle behind the battle. And we have an enemy, as Jesus Christ said, who is a thief who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. It's serious today. It's serious today, but God's word is true. So let's dive into his word. Ephesians chapter 6. Let's take a look at this battle that we're in and get our first glimpse of this enemy. Ephesians 6, verse 12. And as I said last week, I wanna encourage you as I read these verses on the screen, don't just listen to my voice. If you have a Bible, you read yourself. If not, read along on the screen because you want it to penetrate your heart. So let's look, Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. This is the apostle Paul writing. He's in prison at the time. He's chained to a guard. He could have said, I'm in a struggle against this guard. He could have said, I have an enemy, this guard is my enemy. Or he could have said that the Romans are my enemy. Or he could have said that the Jewish leaders who sent me here in the first place are enemy. But no, he said, these are not my enemy. Flesh and blood is not my enemy. He said, we are in a spiritual battle. We have a spiritual enemy. His name is Satan. The evil one is the enemy. That means when you look at your life and you look at people that frustrate you, people that hurt you, You look at the world and you see people that are harming other people. It's so easy to say, well, that organization or that person, they're my enemy. They're not your enemy. The evil one is your enemy. The enemy is the enemy. 
what Paul starts off with. He says, we've got to understand this battle we're in because we just want to make it person to person. I've heard so many people say who've got some years behind them, I've never felt like our country is more divided than it is right now. And it's easy to go, it's because of that person or that person or that organization or whatever it is, but we've got to get above it. We've got to get to the true source. The enemy is the enemy. Satan, his very name means adversary. He is our enemy. And I want you to understand his schemes today. How does he come at us? How does he come at God's people? He does, first of all, with temptation by way of deception. Jesus, describing Satan, called him the father of lies. He is a liar. And what does a liar do? A liar lies. What does he lie about? You look at the encounter that Adam and Eve had in the garden. You look at the encounter that Jesus had in the wilderness. How did Satan come? How did he lie? He lied about the character of God. He told Adam and Eve, God, by not allowing you to eat from that tree, he's holding something back from you. He's trying to rip you off. You can't trust that God. You can be your own God. It was a lie about God. If that doesn't work, he will lie about who we are. Sometimes his lie will be a lie of condemnation. You are the worst. You will never have it. You will never get over this. Sometimes the lie is a lie that pumps up our ego. Man, you are something else. You have it together. You don't need to listen to to encouragement from others or wisdom from others. Or if someone criticizes you, you may say, well, that's ridiculous. There could be all kinds of truth in that. But Satan will say, you don't need that. Those people are dumb. Sometimes it's a lie about God. Sometimes it's a lie about who we are. So often, it's a lie about what would satisfy us, what we can put our trust in. See, when Satan lied to Jesus in the wilderness, he said, hey, he goes, if you bow down before me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. In other words, you don't have to trust your God. He said, don't rely on God. Don't rely on him for satisfaction. What is the ultimate lie of the enemy? The ultimate lie of the enemy is that you don't need God and that you yourself can be God. You don't need to place your confidence in someone else. You can place your confidence in yourself. What you think and what you want to do. And that is the theme that just runs through our world today. Over and over and over again, the theme from the enemy behind it all is that you don't need God. You are capable of living independent of God. But we know, we understand that that never works because when we fall into temptation, whatever it, he lies, you need this now. You'll get away with it. No one will ever know. When you give in to temptation, what does he follow that up with? His second strategy is accusation. You You agree to sin, you participate in sin, and then he pounds on you. It's the one-two punch. Temptation that we surrender to, followed by his accusation. I will tell you this. If we will to, to survey people around the world, for some of them, the most miserable morning of their lives is Sunday morning. And it's because of what they did on Saturday night. They may be thinking, man, I just pursued all this fun. This is fun, fun, great, great, great. But they wake up Sunday morning with such regret because that's the way the enemy works. He will pound us. You're a failure. You will never experience freedom in this area. I can't believe you did this. God will abandon you or God was not with you. He starts with temptation. We give in and he follows it up with accusation. And then the third deadly strategy is isolation. Because when you feel like you have failed, when you feel like you are a failure, especially when it comes to God, the temptation again is to withdraw, is to pull back, is to isolate, is to isolate. You may not do it physically, you may just do it mentally and emotionally. You begin to fake it, you begin to go through the motions That's never the place to be. Satan's design and his desire is to pick Christians off, to have them step out of community and have them try and make it and do it and live on their own. 
being around this place for a long time, talking to a lot of people. Sometimes someone will come with some consistency and then you won't see them. And then it'll, it'll be months and then they'll show back up again. You'll talk and say, hey, what's going on with you? How's life? And they'll say something like this, you know, man, I just, I just wasn't doing very good. And so I, I quit coming, but now I've got it back together. So I'm coming again. When you're not doing very good, this is the very place you need to be. His design, his desire is for us to isolate ourselves. We are desperate for community. We're desperate for community. We're like coals in a fire. We stay together, we're gonna stay hot. We stay together, we're gonna stay hot, but you take that coal and you put it off by itself and it's gonna lose its heat. What burns the fog away? We say it's when the sun comes up. It's not really when the sun comes up. It's when the heat comes with the sun and then the fog goes away. We need the heat of community, but our enemy, he comes, temptation, accusation, isolation. If you ever find yourself pulling back from people, that's the worst thing. The best thing is to be with people. When you're depressed in despair, you just wanna be in a dark room by yourself, the worst thing. Step out, be with people. What does Satan want? He wants us to be isolated. That is his strategy. That's his strategy, but I'm so grateful because the Lord gives us very clear instructions into how to go to battle. He gives very clear instructions as to how to walk through this fog that we find ourselves in. One of the beauties of being part of a community is if you hang out for a while, you're gonna meet some Christians that have been walking with God longer than you have. And they were gonna be able to bring insight to you, people you can depend on for great wisdom. I'm so thankful for that. It will help you grow. Today, we're gonna go listen to three men who really understand what this battle is about. And they lay it out very clearly for us. We've already heard from Paul. We're also gonna hear from him again, James, and then Peter. And I'm gonna read this scripture to you back to back, and I want you to track along with me, and then we're gonna see what the Lord has to say to us. So let's go back to Paul, back to Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. 2 Thessalonians 3. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Now James, James 4. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And then Peter, our friend Peter, we talked about Peter the last couple weeks. Peter the man who denied Jesus Christ. But then after seeing the risen Christ, he was filled with such courage. And now God's led him to write this letter to share wisdom with us. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. So we learn from these three wise brothers, and they are our brothers in the Lord. What do we learn? First of all, we learn the right posture in this battle. What's the right posture? We begin by submitting to God by humbling ourselves before the mighty hand of God. In other words, if we want to do battle against this enemy that's bringing havoc into the world, into our families, into our lives, we've gotta understand that we don't have the ability to fight on our own, but the Lord does. So we start with him. We go to him, those two words, humble and submit, basically what they mean is that you're enlisting. You're enlisting in the army of the Lord and saying, okay, God, I'm not gonna do it on my own. I don't have it, but you have it. It's not that you go toe to toe with the enemy. It's that you trust the Lord who has already done so. But to live in freedom, to live in freedom, to live in the fog is a constant posture of surrendering to him. It's just a constant posture of saying, Lord, I need you today. Lord, I wanna trust you today. 
Lord, not by my strength, but by your strength. Lord, I'm putting my life in your hands. It's a constant surrendering to him. That's where you begin. Not thinking about, okay, I'm just living the life that I'm living right here, right here, just one-on-one relationally with people. But you look up here and you say, okay, this is a spiritual battle. So I'm gonna put my life in the hands of a spiritual God. That's the posture we begin. And then we began to engage. What do we do? He says, we draw near to God because he will draw near to you. Isn't that a great promise? When we pray, when we draw near to God, he's going to draw near to us. We, we, we don't have to create some enthusiasm. My like, God, are you listening? Hey God, are you out there? When we draw near to him, he's going to draw near to us. The best picture of God for me is, is he is a loving father. Jesus completely shook up the religious leaders when he started calling God father. Because they could never imagine that you could be that close. You can be that close, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Honest question, how many of you guys have been frustrated any time this week? If you've been frustrated, raise your hand. Okay. If you've been frustrated with a person, even if it happens to be the person you're sitting next to, anybody across the world this week, raise your hand. Some of y'all aren't being honest. (laughs) Let me encourage you. This week, when you experience frustration about what you see on the news, what you experience at work, what you experience at home, draw near to God and give it to him. See, this is what we're really good at. We're really good at getting frustrated with something in life or someone in life and complaining about it. And we often confuse prayer, I think, for complaining. And we often confuse Christian fellowship for, oh, this is what happened bad to you. Oh, this is what happened to me. Hey, how about let's put it in the Lord's hands. That's what it means to draw near to God. Everything that burdens you, everything that causes fear, everything that causes anxiety, Lord, I'm drawing near to you because you're near to me and I'm putting it in your hands. Lord, I'm placing it in your hands. We submit, we trust him. And because we trust him, we say, Lord, it's yours. Anything, everything, anyone, it's yours. That's how we engage. But then we have to have the right mindset What did Peter say? He says, we have to be sober of spirit. We have to be on the alert because he described Satan this way. He said, he is like a prowling lion looking for someone to devour, devour. Now catch that, not just trip you up, not just cause you to have a bad day or a bad week, bad month. He wants to devour you. Satan is your sworn enemy. He does not want you to have joy. He doesn't want you to have life. He doesn't want your family to experience closeness. He wants to destroy, he wants to devour. That's who he is. But ultimately, what does he want to devour? Your faith and your trust in God. So Peter tells us we have to be on the alert. We have to be aware. We have to be aware that a spiritual battle is taking place. Now, I'm not saying that that means that we walk around and we see a demon everywhere, but you just need to know that when a thought comes your way that that is so negative or so harmful to you or to someone else, that's not you. That's the enemy bombarding you with the thought, the temptation, the accusation that would lead to isolation. So it means we have to be aware We have to be able to understand that when you live this Christian life, that you're playing defense, that you're playing defense, that's defense. But it's easy to think, oh man, if the enemy wants to devour me, could he overwhelm me? Could I lose and never get it back again? That's what he wants you to think, but that's not what the scripture says. So let's look at what happens as we walk forward. Some of you guys who are uh, in the Navy or have been in the Navy, you understand the command battle stations. 
If you're on a ship and you hear battle stations, that means every person urgently has a job immediately in the moment. You go to your assigned position and you take it so seriously. It's battle stations. There's not a sailor who could just say, hey, I'm, I'm hanging out on my bunk. It's nap time for me. Give me a pass. No, you know you have a responsibility to your team. You have a responsibility to your fellow troops. This that we're gonna look at, this is battle stations. And this is not just for you as an individual. This is for you as part of a community, as part of the body of Christ. If we want to see lives changed in our world, we need to understand how seriously God has commissioned us. He has a mission for you today, every one of us, he does. So what is that first step in battle stations? What did we read in the scripture? He says, we are to resist. We are to resist the enemy with the word of God. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, Satan would throw a lie, a fastball right at him. And Jesus would say, it is written. And he would quote scripture right back to Satan. Satan would throw him a lie and Jesus would come right back with the truth. How do we resist the enemy? We resist the enemy with his, with God's word. With God's word, we resist the enemy with God's word. And I think one of the most helpful things to do is when you're dealing with temptation, when you're dealing with accusation, when the enemy is coming against you, is to speak the truth out loud. There's something about reading the words on the page, that's great. But there's something to me that is so powerful about speaking God's truth out loud. And how do we do that? It begins by making sure that we are consuming God's word on a regular basis. God's word is, is referred to as spiritual food. It's spiritual bread. What do we do with bread? We eat bread. We partake of bread. We have to partake of God's word. I was listening to a sister in the Lord yesterday and she said, you know, sadly, most of us can say that we have what's on Instagram or we have what's on Facebook or Twitter. I mean, we can recall that instantly. But when it comes to God's word, we're a little bit shaky the only way to resist with God's word is to know God's word. Chuck Swindoll, great, great Bible teacher. He says this, and I think this is great. He says, I know of no other single practice in the Christian life more rewarding, practically speaking, than memorizing scripture. That's right. No other single discipline is more useful and rewarding than this. No other single exercise pays greater spiritual dividends your prayer life will be strengthened. Your witnessing will be sharper and much more effective. Your counseling will be in demand. Your attitudes and outlook will begin to change. Your mind will become alert and observant. Your confidence and assurance will be enhanced. Your faith will be solidified. How does that happen? It happens because you're memorizing the word of God. I hope you all have a time every day where you're reading God's word, but let me encourage you. God's word speaks to a lie that the enemy has against you. You write it on an index card, put it in your pocket, put it on your phone, put it on the desktop of your computer and say it out loud over and over and over again. And when you are in the heat of the battle, when you want to give in, when you wanna give in to a temptation or you wanna give in to a belief about yourself and God, the Holy Spirit will bring to mind God's word. You may be feeling lonely and think God is gonna abandon me in this. And suddenly you remember the last words that Jesus spoke before he ascended into heaven. He told his disciples, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. That means he's with us always. Always means always. You may be struggling in fear and then all of a sudden you're reminded of Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. You have the opportunity to know the peace of God that surpasses understanding. In other words, as God's word becomes part of you, you will be able to resist the enemy with the word of God. Jesus said it, it worked for him, it works for us. Resist with the word. Then the second thing, we're to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. This is what Paul said in Ephesians. And it's very interesting because the words for strength and the words for might in Ephesians 6 are the same words that are combined together to talk 
in Ephesians 1 about the resurrection power of Jesus. In other words, he's saying, be strong in the Lord. You resist by the word, but you can be strong in the Lord by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. That's the kind of power that's available to you. It's not some small power. It's not some limited power that's available to you. It's the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. That means when the enemy blasts you, when you become aware of it, you take it to God and you say, Lord Jesus, I know by your truth, I know by the power of your word, the resurrection of power of your word, that you are alive and this is what is real. There are so many times that I'll talk to people and they say, I just, I, I just couldn't, couldn't handle it. I couldn't resist. I just gave in and I just hate myself for it. That's because when that happens to us, we have more faith in the power of our sin than we do in the resurrection power of the Lord. And that's why you need a brother and a sister to stand alongside you to remember that's true. When we don't know it's true for ourselves, we gotta have somebody beside us that's gonna say, it's true, you can believe it, you can believe it. I remember when Tanya and I were young in our parenting, we were talking to a mom who, um, her kids were grown at the time and she was telling us about when her daughter was a teenager, her daughter began to believe some of the lies of the enemy. Lies about God, who God really was, but then lies about herself. And she began to believe about herself that she was not fashioned by God, she was not special, and she had to gain attention through some destructive things. And she began to struggle a lot mentally and emotionally. And this mom was so wise, they got her into great biblical counseling And that was helpful. But the mom told us that when her daughter would finally make it off to sleep, when her daughter was asleep, she treated that time as holy ground. She treated it as holy ground. And she knew this is the time for me and my husband to do war on our daughter's behalf. And so they would walk into their daughter's room just completely quietly. And she and her husband, they would just kneel beside the bed. And they just began to plead the grace of God, the truth of God, the freedom of God over their daughter. They were trusting in the mighty, mighty resurrection power of the Lord. Parents, I want to encourage you. You will do it until the day you leave this earth. You plead God's grace into your kids' hearts and into your kids' minds because you can trust the resurrection power. We stand beside our kids even when they don't know it. In fact, they can know it, but, 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 but don't tell them, hey, I prayed for you two hours beside your bed last night. Then they're never gonna go to sleep. <laughs> they may not appreciate it, but God does and God works. You resist the enemy and you trust in the mighty power of the Lord. And then Ephesians 6 says, we put the full armor of God on. Your homework this week is to read Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. This week, and you can see the specific pieces of armor, but let me say this. You're gonna put on something that God has provided. God has given this to you, and he said, put on what I have provided to do battle against the enemy. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. He says, I have given you these things and all you have to do is put it on. You don't have to come up with it on your own. He says, you put it on. Battle stations, friends, you resist. You trust in the power. You put on the whole armor of God. And then we see the victory that has been won for us. What did Paul say in 2 Thessalonians? He said, the Lord will strengthen you and protect you. You can know that. You yield to his strength and then you're going to walk in his strength. His strength is for you. His strength will be there. Even when you don't know it's there, it's there because he has promised it. So if he promises it, then you step out in strength. We give fear so much credit. We give the enemy so much credit and we give God just 
basically lip service. His voice is the most powerful voice of all, and he will strengthen you. He will protect you. He will give you what you need. And then he says, you'll be able to stand firm, to stand firm. He uses a military term because the way the Romans would fight at the time is they would fight shoulder to shoulder. They had big shields and their mentality in doing battle was all I have to do is protect my six feet. I had to protect my six feet around me, behind me. This is the six feet. This is the territory I'm responsible for. And so they would stand shoulder to shoulder with fellow soldiers and say, my job is to protect this six feet territory and stand firm there. In this spiritual battle that we live in, the Lord has given you his power, his strength to guard your six feet. Wherever that is, whatever that is. Your six feet are the people that you live with, the people you go to school with, the people you work with, your team. That's your six feet. That's where you stand firm. Now, do we cry out on behalf of our brothers and sisters around the world who are persecuted? Yes, we do. Do we cry out on those who've been treated unjustly? Yes, we do. But when it comes to living life, we live and we stand firm in our six feet. Oz Guinness said it this way. He says, one of the great tragedies in this last several years is there are so many people in the United States who go by the name of Christian, who have such little influence. See, if we are often, if we are just bombarded and giving in to the enemy and we don't guard our territory, then how can we ever go forward and have any kind of an influence? But in Jesus Christ, in him, you can resist, you can stand firm. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to protect you. And then, did you catch what Peter said? He says, when you stand firm against the enemy, when you submit to the Lord, what's the devil going to do? He's going to flee. He's going to flee. Friends, it is a consistent, persistent battle, trusting You may feel overwhelmed. You may feel like you're in the fog. But the enemy, he will flee at the name of Jesus Christ. (laughs) Because there is no name greater than the name of Jesus. There is no one that you can trust in greater than the name of Jesus. Paul says in Colossians 2 that at the cross that Jesus Christ disarmed the enemy I want you to picture that, an enemy that has no arms. All he can do is just bark. All he can do is lie. But the power of Jesus Christ is greater than all. And so even if our lives feel like we're in such a fog and we're so full of turmoil, even if the news is bad, 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 bad for us, and some of these, I look out here, you've walked through such difficult, difficult stuff. You can know that the rock of Jesus Christ is the rock that you can depend on. Chip Ingram pulls it together for us. He says, we do not fight for victory. We fight from victory. That means when we fight, we're not trying to win. Instead, we're enforcing the victory that Jesus has already secured. Not for victory, but from victory. Because Jesus Christ is the 